Good morning and welcome to Concord Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you can be with us together to worship our God. This morning we're going to hear a Psalm 137 that speaks about Jeremiah's experience of exile. We're going to hear about how Jeremiah was angry and grieving and how he called out to God, asking God for relief. I invite you this morning to consider where are you grieving? Where are you experiencing anger? How can you call out to God as we call ourselves to worship? Nearly every culture mentions clay in its creation myth. The biblical creation story pictures God scooping up a handful of clay, shaping a human creature and breathing life into it. Is it because clay is so like us? Up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay. The great God kneaded down in the dust, toiling in the lump of clay until God shaped it and blew into it the breath of life. Thus spirit enters flesh, according to him the story written down on tablets of clay some 5,000 years ago. Formed in the womb of God, we, made of clay and spirit, are vessels of the vision and essence of God. Fill us, good potter God, with the word of your ways, that we may be a vessel of you. Our opening scripture this morning is from Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1, and this is what it says. Oh no, she sits alone, that city that was once full of people. Once great among nations, she has become like a widow. Once a queen over provinces, she has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night, her tears on her cheek. None of her lovers comfort her. All her friends lied to her. They have become her enemies. Judah was exiled after suffering in hard service. She lives among the nations and she finds no rest. All who were chasing her caught her right in the middle of her distress. Zion's roads are in mourning. No one comes to the festivals. All her gates are deserted. Her priests are growing, groaning. Her young women are grieving. She is bitter. Her adversaries have become rulers. Her enemies relax. Certainly the Lord caused her grief because of her many wrong acts. Her children have gone away captive before the enemy. Daughter Zion lost all her glory. Her officials are like deer that can't find pasture. They have gone away, frail before the hunter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear these words from Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, 
the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect was human as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with braveness and boldness, that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Let us pray. Gracious God, you ask us to follow you, and we respond with logical, logistical questions. How long? Where to? Will we return? You ask us to love each other, and we respond with excuses. I don't know how. We don't see eye to eye. You ask us to dream, and we get stuck in our own heads. Change will never come. Is it worth it? Skilled potter God, I am your living clay. I am your soft, unformed, and being-shaped creation. I am your in-process vessel, well needed by your warm hands. I am clay, becoming who you designed. God, in these moments, we pause to pray and hear you speak. Creator God, show us in the silence your ways you continue to form us. Gratefully, we pray. Hear the good news of the gospel. Christ died for us. Christ raised for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. And so I can declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. I invite you to share the sign of peace with one another. Let us pray. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let our other words slip away. May there be one voice to we hear today the voice of truth and grace. Let your word form and shape us. Amen. A reading from Psalm 137. Alongside Babylon, the streams we sat down, crying because we remembered Zion. We hung our lyres up in trees, and there, because that's where our captors asked us to sing, our tormentors requested songs of joy. Sing us a song of joy, they said. But how could we possibly sing the Lord's songs on a foreign soil? Jerusalem, if I forget you, let my strong hand wither. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I don't remember you. If I don't make Jerusalem my greatest joy, Lord, remember what the Edomites did on Jerusalem's dark day. Rip it down, rip it down, all the way down its foundations, they yelled. Daughter Babylon, your destroyer. A blessing on the one who prayed pays you back the very deeds you did to us. A blessing on the one who sees your children and smashes them against the rock. The Psalms are the most important book of the Bible. You see, the Psalms, they give us an opportunity to express our innermost feelings, the there's songs and poems which put words to the parts of us that we are uncomfortable expressing or we don't know how to name. This is a songbook of the people in a liturgy and a litany of prayers to God and they cover all parts of the human experience. Calvin said that we should read two psalms every day and that by doing so we'd be covering the prayers of all people and maybe they're not words that we are experiencing that day, Calvin says, but 
they're words somebody is experiencing. And so by reading these psalms, we are praying for ourselves and for others on behalf of those who may not be able to pray for themselves. Now this Psalm 137 is one that we like to avoid. <laughs> it's not a very pleasant one. And it was likely written by Jeremiah after the destruction of Jerusalem during the Babylonian exile, somewhere between 587 and 536 BCE. In the Psalm we hear about the utter destruction of their homeland. We hear that the wounds are fresh. It's just happened that they have just experienced this moment of desolation and now they are exiles in a foreign land. They are cast out from their homes. And now they are in this land and they're not even allowed to use the words of their grief because the people, the people in power of that land are denying them that right. They demand they sing songs of joy instead. But they refuse because their wounds are fresh. They've just experienced the loss of everything they knew. Those of us who live through 9-11 can recognize a little bit of those experiences and those feelings. Those who are even now cleaning up from tornadoes in Iowa and hurricanes in Louisiana, they know these feelings. The feeling of losing your bearings, of finding yourself in a strange land, in a strange place. This is a psalm about desolation, a psalm about exile. In this psalm, we hear moments of tearful honesty. This psalm, amongst many psalms, are moments that we call faithful seasons. They're seasons where we have to have deep trust in the God who made us. We have to trust that when moments of desolations come, the God who made us is trustworthy. This psalm offers us words of faith to try on, words that express, in this case, our grief, our anger, our fear, our outrage. This is why the psalm book is so important, why the psalms are called the songbook of the covenant people, because they speak words for us which we don't know how to speak for ourselves. We are comfortable with most of this song, I think. It's understandable to experience these emotions of grief and turmoil after the loss of what you have known, that when we're remembering things that we hold dear, it comforts us in a way to hear the words put into poetry that we feel about the loss of things that gone by, of the memories that we hold dear. You see, the, pro the psalmist promises to remember Zion, to remember the glory days of Zion. The psalmist says they will remember the days gone by which bring a bittersweet joy and contentment and a remembrance of a heart less burdened by life. Where we stumble is verse 9. Content or happy is the one who seizes your children and dashes them against the rocks. It's a record scratch moment, right? Hold on now. How is this in the Bible? It's too horrible. It's too violent. It's too honest, we think. How can someone want to do something so terrible? And yet we have all experienced or will experience this kind of desolation, this kind of grief where we want to wipe out whoever brought the grief to us. But in the end, this psalm is not a psalm about violence. It's not. It's not a psalm about 
causing violence or creating violence, there's no evidence that the psalmist ever carried out these words. There's no evidence that the words that he spoke were put into action. This is a psalm about desperation, about searching for a long withheld justice. The exiles are people who've just seen their city obliterated, completely destroyed. Their kinsmen, the Edomites, did nothing to protect them. In fact, they helped the captors. The Edomites are descended from Jacob's brother Esau. And Jacob and Esau didn't get along, but in the end of their lives, they reconciled. Esau came to Jacob, and Jacob comes to Esau, and they say, can we bury the hatchet? Can we put these years of anger behind us? And yet they never address the root problem. And so while these kinsmen should have been on the side of Judah, what they had instead was years and years of resentment and anger and separation. They did nothing, these Edomites, to stop Judah's exile. It was their search for justice. The Edomites felt like Judah got what it deserved. And Judah is here sitting by the waters of Babylon in a place that should be full of beauty and majesty. And Judah is sitting by the waters crying out for justice. They are a people with their backs against the wall, and from their point of view, this crying out of verse 9, it sounds different. You see, the terrorists, the terrorizers, they keep coming against Judah. They are relentless. And Judah here is saying, make it stop. Just make it stop. You see, these are hate filled people, and they keep burning down our stores and knocking down our homes. And they keep crying out against us and making us sing when we don't want to sing. They are relentless. These haters, they say, they must not be allowed to teach their children this kind of hate, this kind of violence. God, the people of Judah, cry out, make it stop. Make the terror stop. Walter Brueggemann, a renowned Old Testament scholar at Columbia Seminary, puts it this way. He says, these are psalms of cursing, and their actual function is the opposite of violence. What the psalmist is actually doing is saying, God, I know that I can't take out my enemies, but maybe you can. I can't make it stop, but maybe you can, the psalmist says. This is the psalmist's way of turning over justice, of retribution, of turning over violence to God. The psalmist is surrendering their right for violence, their right to vengeance, and almost wishing, almost advising God to do the kind of justice they desire on their behalf. Brigham continues saying that these rants are ultimately about nonviolence, We might, they might scream at the sky about our enemies. We may lift up our voices to God, wishing, imploring God to act on our behalf and advising God of the most just way. Wouldn't it be better, God, if you just got rid of those people I don't like? Couldn't you just do away with my enemies, God? This psalm is challenging that anger and that desperation and which comes with being put out, with no longer being anchored to our remembered places. The Psalms turns those feelings over to God. It's a a song about submission to God's divine right. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I am the only one who gets to decide what true justice looks like. When we feel anger and grief and hatred towards another, there is no better time to remember God is the one who gets to decide the outcome. And that is a blessed thing. How many of us have done things, awful things, said or done things we later regret because we're trapped in our anger? 
I've always thought um, breaking something when you're angry would be like a great release of that tension, of that emotion. But then I always wonder what happens after you throw it? I'm just going to regret breaking it and it have to, I'd have to clean it up. And maybe, maybe the thing we break in our anger isn't fixable, like a person's heart or our own. The psalm is a lament, which reminds us that it's good that we don't get to decide how God writes the scales, that we don't have our hands on the levers of divine justice, for surely we would all do something we regret. We'd turn those words of desperation into actual violence and destroy not only other people's things, but other people. And then surely we would regret and begin the cycle again. This is a psalm about submission to God and a lament that we can't fulfill our sin-filled desire. Laments are an important part of our life experience, of our walk with God. Laments like this teach us to stand up, to put voice and words around the, song, around the pain and the hurt that we have inside of us. These words teach us to say what it is on our heart to name our hurt and our anger. Because to do any less is just to stay trapped inside of the midst of it. To be continually lost. Until we can express those words of despair and desolation with honesty, we stay trapped in the cycle of those feelings, unable to feel, to express, to acknowledge God's words of grace in our lives. We cannot sustain our life this way. A friend of mine explains it this way. She says after her abuse that part of her recovering of identity, part of remembering who she was, a sense of self, she needed to make noise. <laughs> You see, the hurt, the pain, the loss of personness made her feel like she couldn't speak, that she wasn't allowed to speak. And one day she realized that she needed to stand up and tell about what happened to her. And she came and she spoke and she put words to that anger and the hatred. She needed to face her experience. And that's what this psalm is about. You say it, she said, so you don't do it. You use the words of violence and anger so that you don't do the violence that you feel. You load your feelings into words and demonstrations and songs which show the scale of your pain. So best case, you don't continue the cycle. It is hard to experience these words. It's hard to stand up and remember the destruction and the desolation. In many ways, we re-experience them and re-mourn them each time we bring them up. These words of laments remind us that until we do, until we acknowledge the pain we carry around inside of us, we remain trapped in the same old cycle, re-hurting reliving, re-experiencing, recreating the circumstances. We continue the cycle. We do, all of us, need eventually to move into psalms of joy. We need to move past our cycled trap of hurt so we can experience God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's release. The cycle, it becomes so familiar that it feels good. Because we know that, we know what it feels like. It becomes so familiar sometimes we don't even know we're in that cycle of hurt and pain and loss until we poke our head just a little bit above the water. And we say, oh man, I didn't even know. God is waiting for our words. God, the God who Jeremiah speaks about, knit us together 
in the womb. God knows our innermost parts. God calls us by name. God knows what's inside of us. God already hears the words of our souls. God knows the comfort. God knows the words before we speak them. But we need to speak them. These words of rage, the words of anger, the words of grief and despair. Not to each other in the ways they always seem to come out. Our world, our society has enough anger, enough rage and despair. We need to speak them to the one who receives them in a way which leaves us whole. God is the one who receives our rage and our anger. God is the one who hears our despair and our loss, our brutally honest prayers. We don't need to be concerned if we will hurt God's feelings or worry if we're allowed to say the words which come out to us. I remember holding the hand of a mother who had just lost her son, who was so burdened by her fear to speak those words of anger. And the moment when she said, I am so angry, I'm angry at God, I am mad at God, you could see the release. She put words to her feelings. We can offer those words to God and leave them there at the foot of the cross. Lay it out. You are my God and we are God's people. I'm going to be honest and vulnerable. I'm going to say to God that I am angry. I am frustrated. I am going to honestly lift up my experience to God. I am angry that my daughter doesn't get to experience kindergarten like every one of us did. I'm frustrated that we are still trapped in this cycle. And we can turn that experience, that anger, over to God. How much hurt, how much conflict could we avoid if we just turned it over? How much hurt could we avoid if we dealt honestly with our God-given human reactions of rage and devastation and hurt? What if we could speak honestly with God? I am a small lump of clay Here in this large and lovely earth And yet before I knew my name You knew my form, you knew my worth And long I resisted my shape Long I insisted on my own plan now I am softening my way And going back to the potter's hands I am a small lump of clay Here on this large and lovely earth and yet before I knew my name You knew my form, you knew my worth And long I resisted my shape Long I insisted on my own plans And now I am softening my ways And going back to the potter's Hands. Going back to the potter's hands Now I am softening my ways And going back to the potter's hands
We shape each day by the hands of the loving God. We go with this creating God as, as a lumps of clay to be formed. As we go to God in prayer, we open ourselves up to the ways seeking shape today. Let us pray. We thank you, loving God, for the vulnerable yet wonderful gift of life, to be alive and to know this unspeakable honor. We thank you from start to finish. Our life is precious in your sight. May we always praise you for it. Lord, hear our prayers. We thank you, loving God, that those who believe in Christ Jesus have already passed from death to life, and even now are with the bread of heaven. We praise you for this communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting. May we always proclaim hopes that have those despair and those who fight light shines in the darkness of the world. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, whose spirit gave breath to the valley of dry bones, whose touch healed the lame with the word, raise the dead from our pure prayers, hearing those who are afflicted by sorrow and illness, by injustice, by despair, and by fear and weakness. Beneath our hearts, touch our bodies, speak their names, and bring new life to them. We especially pray for those closest to us in our hearts. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, both now and forevermore. And join our vo voices with the choir of those who have gone before us. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and we, for, we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us through the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us consider how we can offer our time, talent, and treasure to God. Finally fall. At last the mist heats haze we woke with these past weeks has lifted. We find ourselves chill, a brisk briskness we hug ourselves in, frost graying the ground. Grief might be easy if there wasn't still such beauty. Would be far simpler if the silver maple didn't thrust its leaves into flame, trusting that spring will find it again. All this might be easier if there wasn't a song still lifting us above it, if wind didn't trouble my mind like water. I half expect to see you fill the autumn air like breath. At night I sleep on clenched fists. Days I'm like the child who on the playground falls crying, not so much from pain as surprise. I'm tired of the tide taking you away, then back again. What's worse, the forgetting or the thing you can't forget. Neither yet, last summer's choir of crickets grows quiet.
We've heard today about how grief can turn to anger, and anger can pen us in, can lock us down. And we've heard today that our anger, our anger at loss, our anger at the things that we feel, we can give those over to God. Our God is big enough for that. Our God is strong enough for that. And so I challenge you today to turn over that anger to God. To go home and be honest with God and say, I'm kind of mad. I'm kind of sad. Whatever it is that you're feeling today, give it to God. Now receive the benediction. May the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and into the life everlasting. Amen.